Scott Farms, just outside of Winnipeg in Rosser. Yeah, we'll see <laughs> how many nods I get. He is expecting a big snowstorm tonight. Yeah, yeah. He's low on beer, but caught tons of toilet paper. Uh, he ha he lives there with his wife and a daughter. Uh, he studied biology in the state of Georgia. No, mm, another state. You studied biology in, I'm picturing a state on the east coast of the U.S. Oh, not to my knowledge. My wife is from Virginia, oh. so oh, she's going to be getting, <laughs> but I, I didn't study anything. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I don't know Scott. I thought so. I, I don't know. Maybe I should back up and say that I, uh, when I studied and worked at the University of Manitoba, and that's where I first met Scott. So I thought he did a biology degree in Virginia, but I was wrong. Yeah, no. I made that up. Uh, but his wife is from Virginia, and he didn't. He didn't study anything. And now, and so he's a he's a wonderful organic farmer who's been very generous with us with like lots of. Um, he's he's he uh, he's on a podcast that he's been doing with uh, with first with uh, Pogi, now with Moa. We've got some um, profiles of him, and he's just been very generous with his time and knowledge. And so that's going to continue tonight. And Scott, you have. I'm going to be the one timing you. And also, if there's anything I forgot that you want to share with the group, other than my, uh, you know, incomplete version of your life, you can go ahead yeah, and do that. Is this off the clock, though? Or when does, when does the timer start? I got to be careful here. Oh, I don't know. Sarah's the, Sarah's the rule yeah. keeper. We can start it once you have your slides up. You can tell us, oh, go, I, and we'll hit the timer. See, I'm in charge of that, so I can do that whenever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll fill in a couple more details for you for the, for the intro. So I... Went through agriculture at U of M. I was going to say nice shared iris. I saw that. Um, and I won't tell you anything about the farm. We'll do that in the in the minutes. I forget. I've got a young family there. I was going to say what I was going to do if I had the day off. We've been building a house for the last year. And uh, my wife would like me just to stay home for a day if uh, if I could manage that. So that's that's what I'll do. So that's it. I'm ready if you are. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, I'll press the button then, I guess. Maybe if I can figure out how to. Okay, here we are. Seven minutes. Starts when? Right now? Now. Okay. So I wanted to talk. I guess I got, a, I got the option to choose what I wanted to talk to you about. And this is what I came up with. Um, I work uh, for a conservation group doing primarily water storage type projects. Um, and recently I've been handed a bunch of uh, Environment Canada money um, that's aimed at designing a kind of climate smart uh, program to sequester carbon on farmland. And it's not a big stretch from the way that I kind of manage my own farm. And uh, so that's what I wanted to talk to you about. What I'm going to do is kind of tell you a little bit about my farm. I'm going to give you an example of uh, just picked one field that has been, we've been doing some stuff on. Um, and then I guess I hope we can have a, a bigger discussion around, around some of the stuff that may or may not work for you guys. Um, I just farm a section. It's not a big farm. Uh, organic grain production has been the, the focus for some time now. It's been, I guess, 12 years uh, since I certified my first field. And then uh, within three years, uh, the rest of my farm was, was all in. Um, we grow a mix of cereals and oil seeds. Uh, Grass-fed beef is relatively new to us. I guess the last three years, we've had our own and we did some custom grazing for a year or two before that. Um, our, the aim of our farm is to, uh, we'd like to see kind of continual improvement in our soils. Uh, we want to grow food and uh, kind of reduce our, our inputs that we need to pay for. Um, I've got two separate farming units, one uh, just west of Winnipeg near Rosser, which is home. Uh, there's a half section there and a half section elsewhere and this Rosser piece is a uh, heavy clay soil, uh, usually too wet uh, with the exception of the last couple of years that have been really dry this way. Um, the other piece is kind of the, the other side of the coin, uh, generally more on the dry side, a sandy loam type of soil. Um, we 
generally get a decent amount of rain, but uh, we have a hard time keeping it down this piece. And so I think it's been maybe what's pushed me in this direction to such a great degree of uh, really trying to work on those soils and be able to put water in the ground when we get the opportunity. Um, I follow this regenerative agriculture movement quite closely, and I think there's a lot that can be learned from, from those that are working in those circles. And I think there's a lot of back and forth sharing that could be coming uh, or going between organic and regenerative agriculture. Um, the, when I look at it, I'm gonna use my mouse a little bit here, if you can see that. Since we've integrated the livestock into a cropping system, it's made all the rest of this uh, a lot easier. We still do some tillage. I don't think we'll ever stop tilling, um, but our, our necessity for tillage seems to be significantly less. Um, our ability to keep a living root growing because we can see some value for it. We can see that even the stuff that we used to call a weed has got some, some use. Um, we're able to, uh, to capitalize on a lot of those things uh, a little more often. So this is just a kind of rough example of what our rotation looks like. We usually have an annual green manure, a year or two a crop, two or three years of pasture, a year or two a crop, and back to an annual green manure. Um, so nothing too fancy, but I guess this pasture phase that's uh, been a little more new uh, has really helped to kind of open some doors and let us mix some different things and, and add some diversity, which um, I think is really helping to to push things in the right direction. Um, the other reason I, I think that we've really thought more about this lately is trying to establish small seeds. We've um, had some reasonable luck uh, trying to put clover into our small grains. Um, this was seeding into a fall rye field. We ended up putting, uh, it was a mix of red and white clover, I believe this year. Um, but I just see the, the benefit of, of doing things like that. And if we are going to get into, in our area, um, a little hotter, drier climate, a little less precipitation, kind of in the early part of the growing season when we really kind of need it to get that kind of stuff established, um, I think if we can help our soils out a little bit, we maybe stand a chance at being able to keep doing this. Um, and if not, I just think it's, it's getting to be pretty tough to do, uh, establish those small seeds reliably. And, and the last couple of years has been a real challenge. And I'm not saying that's, that's climate change or anything like that, but I'm, I'm just saying that, uh, when we can't do that, we really struggle to, uh, to make our system work. Um, we're using lots of intercrops last year. I think it was 80% of the acres that were in crop were in intercrops, uh, different things. This was peas and oats. And you see it went from, this is the same field, the beginning of July to the beginning of August. Um, we got some moisture and we saw this huge shift in kind of what was doing well. Um, the peas weren't terrible, uh, at harvest time, but, uh, there was definitely the oats kind of took over and were the bulk of the yield. And I think that was a good thing. So this is the example field that I want to run through. This was a year of organic corn. Uh, we underseeded it at the last cultivation pass uh, to uh, alfalfa grass mix. Uh, we combined it, so this was three years ago uh, in the middle of March, uh, about so I had my wife pushed her up the steps into the combine and she delivered our first baby about three days after that. So we had to get it done. Um, so that was that. And this was the following year. So you can see all the corn over underneath. This was the alfalfa that came back. We graze uh, in a fairly intensive type system. We move animals every day. Uh, they get about an acre or an acre and a half, depending on what's out there. And then we irrigate uh, immediately right behind them to try and uh, push that system and, and really make sure that those forages get enough moisture. And so we're doing a, a little bit of irrigation, which is also kind of new to us. Um, but the last couple of years, it's uh, really been a good thing. 
so we broke that alfalfa up after two and a half years kind of thing it was uh july of last year we broke the alfalfa up we seeded fall rye into it uh in the middle of august um and this was that fall rye field we did some uh, we went in and seeded a uh an annual mix uh, into that fall rye just with uh, a disc um, early in the spring to try and kind of fill some holes. We didn't have a great looking stand um, because it was so dry the last couple of years prior. And uh, from how much moisture that alfalfa had pulled out of that system. And this is up in that, in the drier uh, piece that I had mentioned. Um, I tried, we've got a roller crimper and I've been experimenting with it, trying to find the spot that we can use it. Uh, and I was hoping this was going to be it because the rye wasn't looking great. Um, I thought maybe I could knock it down and the annuals would come through and uh, there was just no moisture there. So we knocked it down and it didn't yield anything and the annuals didn't really do much uh, either. So this was after the grasshoppers came through. Um, there is not much left in the swath. I remember I couldn't figure out where I was cracking all the grain in the combine because I was looking at the tank behind me and wondering what was going on. And finally I got out and looked at the swath in front and realized it's because half of them are half eaten before they went in the combine. So this was after the rye came off, uh, we had lots of nitrogen from that alfalfa plow down. Um, and this is actually wild oats, if you can believe it. And we never really have a wild oat problem in the field. We're usually short enough on nitrogen that it never seems to show up too badly. But we got some moisture in the fall and there was huge growth. And actually the, the calves did very well. They were out grazing on it till the middle of December uh, this past year. And so it, it turned out to not be too bad of a thing. Um, but yeah, we're trying to kind of push the animal integration and, and keep them in that, that cropping system as much as we can. This is just a picture of that irrigation system that I kind of mentioned that we're using. So it's not a, it's a low infrastructure thing. You drag it around with a quad. Um, and I also wanted to show, we've been planting a lot of shelter belts uh, to try and manage our, our wind, um, try and kind of create a little microclimate uh, to reduce the evaporation as well provide some shelter for the animals and everything else so we've been spacing these at every 800 to 1000 feet uh, across the, the fields and uh, this was kind of the first one we planted so it's the biggest but yeah was, we've been splitting fields up into into smaller fields for a little while now and it's been working good so that's all I got how was it Thanks, Scott. That was great. Uh, that was 10 minutes and 21 seconds. Felt like three. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no I think good. you're a good company there. Everybody is like shocked at how fast it goes. <laughs> that was we great. Thanks, Scott. Enough.